And thank you, Paul. We are moving into the portion of our program today to listen to cases from the clinicians. I'm going to introduce our moderator for that session and the case presenter. And uh, I will briefly introduce the rest of our group who will be on the panel. So Dr. Sag, Dr. Michael Sag is a professor of medicine emeritus at University of Alabama at Birmingham and is the founding director of the UAB 1917 HIV clinic, which has pioneered treatment programs based on not just real world clinical trials, but also studies focused on quality improvement in the area of HIV. He has numerous uh, titles after his name and has been involved in many things over the years, serving as the co-PI of the NA Accord uh, at UAB, which is an international uh, collaboration of more than 30 sites that merge data for comparative effectiveness research. He serves on the Executive Steering Committee of the ARTCC collaboration, a similar international cohort research group. He's on the board, has served on the board of directors for the ABIM as chair of the ID subspecialty board, the NIH Office of AIDS Research Advisory Council, president of the HIV Medical Association, and is a member and current chair of the IES USA guidelines panel on antiretroviral therapy, and similarly, the treatment guidelines group for the AASLD, IDSA, IES USA hepatitis C treatment guidelines. He's received numerous awards and accolades over the years for his work in HIV and for his teaching skills. And some a little known fact is that he published in 2014 a memoir entitled Positive, One Doctor's Encounters with Death, Life in the US Healthcare System. Dr. Sag, would you like to take over and briefly introduce the rest of our panelists today? Sure, thank you, Connie. Um, uh, Dr. Bedimo, everyone has already met and heard from. Dr. Jill Blumenthal is from uh, uh, up north in the uh, New York City area, and uh, uh, you will be hearing from her after this, and uh, uh, I think you'll find her discussions uh, to be uh, quite uh, helpful in terms, well, well, we'll talk more about that, but she's a clinician. Uh, who takes care of a lot of HIV patients. Dr. Susan Kuvivin um, is from Brown University, has been a prominent HIV researcher for the years, and also um, uh, especially focuses on women's health. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll get into some really detailed uh, discussion with her as we get to pregnancy issues. And finally, Dr. Melanie Thompson, who's from Atlanta, uh, she has a longstanding history of doing clinical trials, but really pioneered a lot of the work in uh, use of, of uh, clinics outside of academic centers uh, through the CPCRA and some other organizations, and also as a former chair of the ISUSA guidelines. So uh, it'll be uh, all of us, plus uh, Dr. Benson, hopefully yeah, you're going to hold on with us here, and we will have a, uh, I think, a pretty vibrant discussion. So welcome, everybody. Um, for those of you who've seen me do this before, um, I have changed the cases up from what we uh, have talked about previously. So this is a kind of a fresh look um, at some new information. Some of the questions obviously are going to be the same because of when to start and that type of thing. But the, <laughs> the answers are changing, which is kind of always interesting. Um, so let me uh, advance my slides here. This is, uh, these are my uh, uh, conflicts. Somebody asked earlier, can we leave this slide up a little longer? So I'll filibuster for a second and just say that in addition to having uh, the commercial relationships here, it's also in the syllabus. So if you wanna dig in a little deeper, you can. So we're gonna talk about a lot of things today and I'm, I'm gonna slow the pace down a little bit so that we can really dig into some of the answers and explore them. We're gonna talk about starting antiretroviral therapy. We're gonna talk about associated weight gain, but what to do about it, Dr. Bedimo just went over that. Um, are you or plan to, as a patient who plans to become pregnant? We're gonna dig into a little bit more on a Bacavir in today's world. 
Uh, Dr. Bedimo alluded to this a little bit in his talk. And then try to bring in some new stuff on MPOX and COVID-19. And what do we do there? And then finally, uh, how do we take care uh, specifically of patients who have frequent STIs? Um, Dr. Bedimo's title of his talk was In Case You Missed It. So since we started this webinar, there are two things that have evolved uh, in the United States anyway. One is that Brittany Grenier has been released from prison in uh, Russia and is now on her way back to the United States. So that's something to celebrate. And the second thing is the House passed the Senate bill on protection of gay marriage. And that bill, that legislation is moving right now to President Biden's desk, where I expect he will sign it today. So good news on that front. So in case you missed that, now coming back to HIV. What regimen should I use as initial therapy? So this first case is a 48-year-old guy who presents with newly diagnosed HIV. He's asymptomatic. His initial HIV viral load was 280,000. His CD4 count was 65 cells. Other labs are normal. We have some data back already. His gene type is wild type. His other medical history is fairly uh, benign, for especially for a 48-year-old. He has normal renal function, and he's okay to start therapy. The question is, uh, what regimen would you choose? And just to kind of orient you a little bit here, TXF would be either TDF or TAF, and XTC is either FTC or 3TC. Uh, in a couple of cases, when there's a fixed dose combination here, you'll notice that I then specify, like for example, choice three, which is only available Elvitegravir in a fixed dose combination, similarly with Bictegravir, et cetera. Um, but for the, the other ones, X means either or. Uh, so that simplifies things. The, the polling is up. Um, hopefully people are already voting. Uh, we'll give it a few seconds here and then we'll move on. And we've enlisted the help of some generic music that is not copyrighted and we can generate lyrics to this and then copyright it ourselves. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll make a fortune or probably not. Okay, let's see what our poll shows. All right, 88%. You know, this reminds me a lot of the 2007 era where there was a fixed dose combination of uh, TDF, FT, uh, TDF, FTC, and uh, Favarins, and it was usually around this. And look where we are now. We don't even have it. <laughs> we don't even have it as a choice. Um, so, who wants to kick off here? Um, I can only see um, a couple of you at, in my screen at one time. So, um, maybe I'll turn to uh, Dr. Thompson. Yeah. Well. You know, I think um, I would start by eliminating the things that I wouldn't give. Um, and that would be uh, anything with a booster. So wouldn't give um, the l vitab cobicistat uh, combination. I wouldn't give the darunavir ritonavir or COBE combination. Um, in this instance, uh, if, if I found out that this gentleman had uh, in some way acquired HIV on uh, cabotegravir prep, which is very unlikely given that he's had HIV for quite a long time, um, then I might consider the darunavir boost. But, but right now, I think we're really focusing on unboosted drugs. So dolutegravir um, with the TXF or XTC would be one option. But going with the bictegravir, or the dolutegravir 3TC gives you a single drug uh, combination. Now, initially, there were some concerns about dolutegravir 3TC and low CD4 counts, uh, less than 200. I think that's not so much been borne out, but I, I think I would probably uh, default to bictegravir TAF FTC for this patient. Okay, others, uh, Dr. Blumenthal, what, do you, what would you do here? Yes, I echo what Melanie said. Um, you know, eliminating the ones that really just uh, would would not be good for a patient brings you down to just a few options. Um, I see a lot of younger uh, patients living with HIV. Simple is easy. Single tablet regimen is really what most people want, um, and. Um, 
you know, there's always the concern uh, if you don't have any, oh, we had that the genotype was wild type. Um, you know, sometimes we don't have that information and, uh, you know, the concern with an M184V at baseline would make me move away from uh, the 3TC dolutegravir. It also, you know, we know that big, uh, uh, big TAF FTC has a lot of forgiveness when you first meet a patient, you don't know how they're going to do with their adherence. We hope that everyone will succeed. Um, but giving someone a regimen where there is room for, um, you know, missed doses makes it, uh, I think, more comfortable for both patient and provider, at least to start. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Benson. Um, the only other comment, I agree with the other uh, panelists, but the only other comment I would make is, I think you said that his viral load was 280,000. Mm -hmm. So that might lead me away from the two drug combinations, at least as initial therapy. So perhaps the direct to inject and the 3TC dolutegravir might be reserved for once you have better control of viral replication. Yeah, and you know, that, that's an interesting concept. Right now, uh, for use of cabotegravir and rolpivirine uh, IM, the, the recommendation or the, uh, the package insert, whatever, says that we have to get them undetectable and then transition to that. But, you know, uh, Monica Gandhi in San Francisco, maybe not with a viral load this high. Let's say the viral load was 15,000. Right. Um, there are right. some patients who might, if they can't, they say they can't take a pill and they're in trouble. Um, let's pause and, and, and talk about that for a minute. Uh, has anyone ever done that um, where you have somebody like this, where you have not waited to get them on an oral therapy to go undetectable, to put them on the injection, but literally direct to inject with the viral load? It's off label. So I'll, I'll make that clear for the compliance purposes, but uh, yeah. real world is, is, have people done this? I I have tempt, I have been tempted several times, except I'm afraid mm -hmm. of the compliance police. Ah. And and because I really think that those uh, patients will, will be excellent candidates for uh, such a therapy. And another thing that I would say about uh, your choices is, I don't know if it was obfuscation on your part, but you did not mention hepatitis B testing and and which would be yeah the hepatitis b is critical to know <clears throat> and so, i guess i should have explicitly but he he had nothing right in this case um so you know, there, like there was, there was an there was an interesting study presented at i think at ias might have been glasgow on um, not just direct to inject but simultaneous administration of the oral um, cabotegravir, real pivorine, plus the injectable to get people's levels up really rapidly and then moving to uh, injectable. So not waiting that whole month of oral therapy, but immediately starting um, both the injection and the oral therapy until um, patients were comfortable. Mm, so that's, that's another potential option. Yeah, Dr. Kuguven, what do you uh, think? This is not your particular case, but uh, a few months ago, I had a big dilemma. We had a pregnant patient, antiretroviral na naive, high, high viral loads, just not adherent to any antiretroviral therapy. We tried directly observe therapy. She would run away from us, hide from us, can find her. And then when we find her, she says she hasn't been taking, she wants uh, liquid. We found liquid uh, antiretroviral therapy, just to bring down her viral load. Uh, then even liquids did not help. She doesn't want a peg. This was the one time that I was tempted. Mm. If cabotegravir and real pivirine. I know it's not recommended in pregnancy. We were reaching second trimester. And I was so desperate, but nobody could give me the right answer. And the unfortunate ending is that for the first time in almost 15 years, we have an HIV infected baby. And I 
can't stop blaming myself and say, should no. I just have given the injection? Uh, this is the one time probably that I should have just. Yeah, boy, well, it's it's really tough. So I uh, see that several of our panelists are being led but into temptation. temptation. <laughs> you your pastor saying, "Do not be led." I am not into advocating temptation. it, but I I can tell you, I was very sorely tempted, knowing that I wanted to prevent uh, perinatal transmission as well as also, you know, for the health of the mother. But yeah, great. Thanks, Susan. Uh, let's go, Dr. Thompson, and then Jill. Uh, uh, go ahead, Melanie. Yeah, I mean, this is not really about the choice of therapy, but I, I think this is a guy that you really want to spend a lot of time understanding, getting to know, you know, CD4 counts very low. Um, why is it that he is presenting to care right now with the CD4 count that's very low, high viral load? Um, does he need more support? You know, this is a person who uh, these these late diagnoses are very, very concerning and and people are late with their diagnosis or late presenting to care, um, not for random reasons. Usually they're usually life reasons that cause this. So I, I think he needs a lot of attention. He leads, needs a lot of support because what you really want to do is to get him back for the next visit and the visit after that and the visit after that. Um, and so I, I would spend a lot of time trying to understand his life circumstances, uh, deal with um, the, the needs that he might have, transportation, food, um, housing, that sort of thing, um, to be sure that he's going to be given every chance to succeed. Yep, that's right. Jill? Two comments, again, agree with, with what's been shared. I think we can't... Um, forget the the role that insurance plays. Um, and it's not like just getting uh, long acting cabotegravirol piverine happens immediately. And I think all of us have access to, um, you know, oral therapy. If you know, there was a comment about rapid start, what does that mean? And there are different definitions for that. But if we're trying to get people on quickly, we know we can do that with pills, um, you know, very easily. Um, you know, the other thing I'm, I'm chatting in the background with one of my, uh, pharmacists at the Owen clinic in, uh, at UCSD, I think we have the most patients maybe in the world taking cabotegravir, rolpivirine. That's a little brag for us. Um, uh, they've still not done any naive direct to inject with a lot of the concerns that have been brought up. Um, it's tempting, but the idea of a brand new diagnosis, want to see that person, want to get to know them a little bit. Um, and it sounds like the earliest they've gone is uh, two months where, yeah. where the, then the switch occurs. I'm sure it will happen, but but not currently. Thank you for correcting my error and where you're located. Um, sorry. About I, that. I'm from New York City or New York. Uh, that's so that's I, why. I just got in. I just left it. New York City. I'm sorry yeah. about that. So <laughs> welcome from San Diego. It looks like you're in your attic. That's good. Yeah, um, it's in an attic. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think we can summarize a couple of things. Number one, um, if the viral load is lower, I think more people are comfortable uh, with maybe starting Dalutegravir 3 tc up front when you know that they're not hepatitis C, uh, B, co-infected, and you know they don't have a uh, M184V. This notion of this rare case where you might start cabotegravir ropivirine immediately I think we'd like to see those conditions met here as well, and and the, the insurance issues uh, built. There's actually an abstract recently presented by the company that makes this compound, uh, this this injection, uh, where they had in clinical trials some patients, about thirty, I believe, who uh, became pregnant or were getting in the tail end of the study. Um, some exposure to cabotegravir or piverine, and they report the outcomes. And you can't judge anything from 31 patients or something, but it but it did happen. And uh, so they they're going to start a more of a registry or formal trial. But I think look at the big picture here. Um, what great choices overall, right? I mean, this is if we can get folks on treatment and move them forward. It's it's uh, the fact that we can do that. And the, we've heard about the guidelines a lot, but a lot of these details are discussed in that document. So 
I think, Jill, you mentioned uh, the M184 v. So let's look at this. Um, here we have a, a woman who presents um, newly diagnosed low viral load, high CD4 count, hitting some of the criteria. Um, we hardly check HLA-B5701 uh, anymore, but this was checked. Oh, before we go, let's let me take a time out. One of the questions from the audience was, what about very rapid start? Anybody doing that? How how are you all kind of handling that in general? Anybody got a like a almost direct to treat at the point of care where they're diagnosed? Is that with long acting regimens or just rapid? No, start? no, no. Sorry, just in general. So you you have a relationship, say, with an, an ER that they are doing universal testing. They test positive in the ER, and you have a system to provide medicines. Anybody? have that capacity or want to advocate for that we we tried it uh, they did it they did it in atlanta melanie i think for a while at emory or at the grady uh clinic and it was successful but it took an awful lot of resources and i think they uh they kind of abandoned it after a while um so well, I, actually i think they they abandoned it for a little while but um you know, it does take a little more resource up front, but um, I, I think it's a good thing to do for the right people. Not everybody is ready on the day that they walk in, but a lot of people are actually. And um, I, I think the first clinic visit or the day of diagnosis, um, you know, un unfortunately, we don't have good systems where always we people who are diagnosed have access to clinical care at that same time. But but I have seen very good results in my own practice with people getting treated immediately. Um, the feeling that, you know, if I told you you had uh, a staph infection, I wouldn't say come back in a, a week. That's very different because it's short term. But, you know, I think that people are... Um, some people really appreciate the fact that they are actively doing something to fight their infection. So um, I, I think rapid start is a really good thing to do given all the caveats. Um, if, if you have the resources to deal with the patient's needs and the patient wants to do it. Yeah, it's right. the default in our clinic. That would be what we would ideally want to do. And most of the time, I must say, we're able to do that. Uh, but like you said, requires a lot of resources. We have five social workers in the clinic, so that helps. We have a far, we have two pharmacists in clinic. We have an ID physician or HIV specialist available every single day. We're open Monday to Friday. So unless it's nighttime or weekend, we can see walk in patients. We so, but it, it is a it's an orchestra that needs to have a good conductor. But if you can make it happen, it's it really works. Really, yeah. works very good. Yeah. So I, it's variable. I'm I'm loving this uh, discussion that I'm seeing in the. Q&A and a, a little bit in the chat, we sort of like the comments more in the Q&A, but it seems like some centers of, of the audience are really doing immediate uh, thing. And, and I smile a little bit when I see that because there were, uh, it was about a decade and a half from uh, the mid nineties till about 2010, where I was advocating, why aren't we treating everyone and why are we waiting? And now it's like, you're being shamed if you don't treat on the same day. I mean, it's it's kind of funny how we've come around, but um, in our clinic, and I think in most, uh, because it's more manageable, is that if there's a referral of a newly diagnosed person, we get them seen within a couple days in our clinic. Phone calls go start to happen. Social services, case management gets involved. We try to get them by for a pre-clinician visit uh, where blood is drawn and all the labs are checked, and then within that week or within just a few days after that visit, they see the clinician. Sometimes it's the same day, but it might not, it's hardly ever in the actual acute care setting because um, of the logistics, exception being um, acute seroconversion syndrome when we suspect that. Um, so let's come back to our case here. Um, you have an M184V at, at baseline. 
Um, she doesn't have any plans at the moment uh, to become pregnant. She's okay to start therapy. So um, let's see what our choice is. It's similar to what we had before. Um, I'll let you all peruse that and uh, uh, think on it for a minute and vote. And we'll cue the music to uh, stimulate our thinking and put us to sleep. I hope you're going to make up a song to this. Yeah. yeah. Let me hear, listen a little more here. Yeah. It's almost like Barry White. You know, you kind of want to, what would I choose here kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, let's see what we got. All right, a little bit more variety. Um, Susan, you wanna you wanna walk through these responses, and do you agree with the uh, the fixed dose combination? Like where th that would be available overseas, the Dalutegravir three TC TAF uh, single dose combination. Yes. I wouldn't fault anybody for choosing that. It used to be, we had a scare with dolotegravir because of the Chapama study that showed an initial signal of neural tube uh, problems with the use of dolotegravir, particularly before pregnancy. Uh, but like the scare with the favorance, with more data coming on, longer follow-up, it really didn't pan out. So. There's no more uh, contraindication to use dolotegravir, um, even if you're planning to get pregnant. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I had a blind spot here when I put this question together and that uh, I didn't have BIC as an answer. So let, why don't you comment about that? So yeah. this is a woman who is not currently pregnant and 30 years old. Would you, in the 184V, we sort of alluded to that if you're putting anything but the um, the three TC dolutegravir. I think everyone knew not to do that. So yes. you know, expand further with BIC. Would you use that the fixed dose? Uh, you know, it's it's uh, well. I'm talking mainly about dolutegravir as the as the base as the as the. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use the other combinations that are um, based on her resistance mutations. The issue with Bictegravir in, in women, if they're not really planning to get pregnant, that, you know, that's a great choice. Uh, it's a recommended treatment. The reality is um, women get pregnant most of the time unplanned. Uh, they're very seldom that they come for pre you know, preconception counseling. And they might not have any intentions of getting pregnant, uh, but they do get pregnant. And we have insufficient data in terms of Victegravir based therapy, in terms of uh, pregnant women in the first trimester at least. So I, that would be a discussion, um, you know, uh, and see what there's, uh, circumstances are, or do they have a partner? Uh, you know, have they talked to the partner? Does the partner agree that, you know, especially if they're using condoms only, which is not female, uh, really controlled in many ways. And what are the chances of you having an unplanned pregnancy? That would be my concern about big tegravir. Um, so, um, of course, you know, we do, uh, we do a, a genotype for all people that we start an antiretroviral therapy. We don't wait, but you have to, you do have a result of 184, so you would really want to avoid drugs that are resistant to that. But in right. terms of the pregnancy question, you know, the lotography is recommended, whether you you're planning to get pregnant or you yeah, know we're gonna we're gonna get into this in, in a future question yeah. coming up here. So uh Dr. Benson. So I'm just curious. Um, no one's mentioned this yet. So maybe Roger, you can comment on this. You talked a little bit about the ongoing data collection regarding a back of ear. 
And given that the prior patient was 45 and this patient's 30, what are your thoughts about the use of abacavir in the regimen now, given the, the concerns for potential cardiovascular disease? Yeah, so uh, what, when I look, thank you. When I looked at uh, this, I look at this question, I would say, okay, now um, the IAS USA guidelines, we say all the treatment for most people with adult drug therapy, too many situation is uh, integrase based regimen, either with big tegravir or dolutegravir. And uh, either, and if it's dolutegravir, with 3 tc with those caveats. Now, what with the pregnant woman uh, could uh, detract from any of those options. Uh, we we do uh, ha we did have the concern to Pam one AAR, but uh, about neurotic defect with the telegraphy. But impact two ten has actually uh, showed us that the outcomes are better. The pregnancy outcomes are better. Fewer complications with. Uh, Including preterm and uh, low gestational uh, uh, age, and uh, with with uh, dolutegravir, with uh, either uh, uh, TDF or TAF plus FTC. So TAF FTC has not had a lot of data, but now with the impact to ten, I think that it's a reasonable um, uh, 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 option. I, in terms of weight, I think that what is important to note is that. When uh, uh, efavirenz have uh, been compared with uh, in 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 weight gain in in, in pregnant women with HIV, it actually uh, they had less weight gain than you would expect uh, based uh, uh, um, and compared to uninfected people. So I don't know that the weight gain has been a detraction for me in terms of uh, 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 pregnant women um, uh, with HIV. Okay, Jill. Me? Are you able to go back to the case for one minute? I just wanted to make sure I wasn't saying anything incorrectly about this person that you described. Are okay. you able to flip back? Oh, whoops. Oh, oops, I'm going the wrong. Did way. I really throw things off? Here I'm so there, sorry. There's a story. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I, you know, I, there's a comment about you know, dependent. It depends on the person's. Um, sexual orientation. I, I think this just is a reminder that it's important to take a good sexual history. We're probably all making the assumption that this is a person who got infected via, um, you know, sexual intercourse. We don't know if that's the case. And, and it would really depend on, um, you know, who she was actually sexually active with. Could she get pregnant? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of assumptions are often built in to that. And in our, you know, in, when we're meeting someone for the first time, I think taking a detailed sexual history where you're making sure you're addressing these things uh, is really important. Yeah. Um, so one other thing, and then we'll move on, uh, or maybe Melanie and Roger, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on just in the interest of time. Yeah, just a quick comment um, here. And I actually regretted not saying this at the very first case, but, you know, um, dolutegravir, back of your 3TC has been a standard for initial therapy for a long time. Uh, but with the new ISUSA recommendations, we have actually um, taken a back of your out of the picture for most people, uh, just because there are other regimens that uh, are available now. And because a back of your does have this association that just will not go away um, with uh, cardiovascular disease. So mm -hmm. I would just throw that out whenever we're considering initial therapy that uh, for the most part, we or not the ISUSA recommendations definitely are not recommending in the back of your containing regimen. Roger? Actually, I just wanted to say exactly the same thing because I, uh, Connie, I'm sorry, I did not address the back of your issue. And, and it's, uh, we know, I, I don't know that I could say it's not going away. I said that we're we never will know, and unfortunately, and and knowing what we know now about some metabolic cardiometabolic potential risk of other drugs, maybe it should get another look. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so one final thing, Roger, and I know we've spent a lot of time on just two cases, and we'll speed this up. But do you take into account the potential for weight gain as you make your decision? 
for what to start? Yeah. Yes, I do. And, and number one, to admit the patient that I'm ignorant in uh, uh, that this is something that occur, uh, but we not yet sophisticated to, enough to predict to whom. It's definitely the a, a, a problem of outliers. The majority of people don't get anything. A minority will gain a lot. Now we know that uh, for women and for non-whites, it's more likely to occur. So I need to tell that to the patient that uh, since you are more likely to, to, to gain, maybe I can throw a few, no, a few probabilities. And uh, would you uh, uh, prefer an alternative regimen? And right. also to admit to them that I don't know, although data is accumulating now, whether should you gain weight on this, that I, I, I can, you, you can reverse this if I should switch. Yeah, we're going to get to that. Um, so this is kind of fun because we just had two talks, one on uh, monoclonal broadly neutralizing antibodies, so everyone was well-versed, and um, we heard some updated uh, new drugs like lenacapavir. So what should we use, let's say just three weeks from now, we're at the same story as the first case, which you can see in light green, but let's say... Um, you know, you have the standard regimens that a lot of people have chosen, like either the um, TAF, FTC, Dalutegravir in two different tablets or uh, that. But then, and we have the Cavitegravir, but what if the drug is Latrovir, that's a nucleotide translocation inhibitor comes along, and it can be given with lenacapavir every three months or broadly neutralizing antibodies, maybe with lenacapavir every six months. Let's go ahead and just vote. And then the final is a potential implantable. We don't have this. It may be in the works, but just hypothetically, um, go ahead and vote what you think you might, what's desirable to you as a clinician, assuming these things work equally well. Let's go ahead and vote and cue the wonderful music. Oh boy. A little bit more upbeat. Kind of reggae. Um, not great, great, great. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, all over the place. So who wants to be the first? Uh, uh, Connie, let me let you start and uh, talk about what, what of these are the most appealing, assuming they actually work. Well, I think so far that's a pretty big assumption, although I think we're very close with lenacapavir to being realistically able to do subcutaneous therapy, either with that in combination with something else or with maybe aslatrovir. They've reopened the clinical trials for aslatrovir and with a different dose, hopefully uh, leading to less reduction in CD4 count and lymphocyte counts. But uh, the results remain to be seen. They both look like reasonable drugs. And I think I, I really want to go back to the concept. Every There was a lot of enthusiasm in the Q&A and the chat from the audience about rapid start and getting people on therapy immediately. And so I really like this concept personally of starting with a fixed dose combination oral regimen until you get to know the patient. Jill, Melanie, and, and uh, Susan all commented on really wanting to develop a relationship with the patient and getting to understand what drives their, their willingness to take their therapy before you immediately embark on some of the injectable options. But I really like the concept of starting initially with a, an oral regimen that you know is going to be very effective and very well tolerated, and then switching to some of these more uh, innovative, but yeah. long acting injectable com combinations. So yeah, my, my sense to that point, Connie, is that I doubt these are going to be used right off the bat. Yeah, uh, it's going to be developed like probably like cavitegravir or pivoting. To me, uh, just for the interest of time, I'm going to move on here. But um, I think that implantable concept, you know, it's similar to what we've done with birth control. Um, historically, it does require surgery. But, you know, if it, if it lasts every uh, 12 months, wow. And is not, I mean, and the other thing, if you get a toxicity, theoretically, you could pull it out. Um, and, and as you have an injection or something else like a BNAB, you get a problem 
it's still floating around in there. So that could be exciting. Joe, I'll let you have the last word. Well, Mike, I just wanted to say you are speaking like an obstetrician gynecologist. <laughs> I can be taught. <laughs> I just really quickly wanted to say you said what is most uh, appealing to a provider. But of course, what matters the most is what's appealing. Oh, yeah, Assuming everything right. works. I'm just, you know, having a little fun with you, Mike. Um, well, yes, you. What, you. what do you, you know, what do you want? What works? What do you think will work best for you? Yeah, um, and I, I think we all know that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, well stated from San Diego. Okay. Um, let's, let's move on to the next. Oops. Um, now simplifying the initial regimen. Um, this is more or less, a, it is the same guy who we had on the first case. Um, he got started on a combination of dalutegravir taf ftc his viral load is is good um is this someone you might want to change therapy for um his viral load is now suppressed etc uh would you continue the regimen or would you simplify in some kind of way we'll do this quickly let's go ahead and vote now we're in rag time I don't know if you ever saw that play, it's fabulous. Um, it's based on a book by A.L. Doctorow from 1972. Father was well off, very good. He made his considerable fortune by the sale of hunting and fireworks and other accoutrements of patriotism. Let's go ahead and see what the name is. All right, so most people are George Herbert Walker Bush. Don't change, wouldn't be prudent. A um, couple of folks go into a combo of just two drugs, uh, hepatitis B negative or immune and uh, M184V negative uh, or an injectable. Uh, Jill, to your point, what does the patient want? Of course, that's key. Uh, but among, assuming the patient would be amenable to any of these, I think especially the injectable, a lot of people are asking for that in these cases. Um, anybody wanna chime in here? Just unmute and start talking. Yeah, I, I think it really is a lot about what the patient wants. Um, you know, being able to decrease to a two drug regimen, thalutegravir 3TC is appealing for uh, a lot of reasons. Um, uh, eliminate some of the lipid interactions, uh, potential weight gain with TAF. Um, so I think, you know, that is a, a decent um, uh, option. Uh, with the injectable cabotegravir, I, I actually have a, a lot of patients who have been very interested in it, but the more you talk about it, the less interested they get because um, they don't want to come in every two months. Yeah. And their it schedules is. are such that it's it's a little harder to do. So, you know, I think um, that plus the burden on the practice is significant in terms of trying to get it approved. Um, it really has taken a huge amount of work and many, many uh, times it's turned down by the insurance companies. So, so right here, let me uh, let me throw in a, two bonus questions uh, that we don't have polling on, but it does, it is germane to what the pre and post test is. So I'm going to throw these out there. Let's say this is the same guy, except now his HIV RNA is, has never gone below 50. It's below a hundred, but it's been hovering like it's 60, 65, maybe goes up to 80, back down to 50. Um, is that antiretroviral therapy failure, Jill? What are you going to do there? Uh, this is, you know, a, a, a common concern that comes up, um, you know, and it depends on there's so many factors that go into this. There is patient um, nervousness when they see, um, you know, their, their lab go from, you know, if it, if this person ever got to undetectable, but maybe you're saying they didn't, but they're like, what does this mean that it's still there? Um, so I, I think it has a little bit to do with, with what the patient is experiencing. Um, I do try to reassure patients, you know, that less than 200 is, is really sufficient. Um, and we know that, you know, when we switch patients to other regimens for these viral blips, uh, it's 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 so variable whether we see a change. And I think it's very patient dependent. I'm thinking of one patient that I have that's always had blips and he, and he switched over to cabotegravir, rolpivirine, 
he's still having blips. It hasn't changed anything. And he's probably more anxious now because he's like, this is supposed to be, you know, what's, what's going to work. Um, so I don't, I try to reassure patients um, that that is fine, that, you know, prior assays, if we had a, less than a hundred, we wouldn't even know that anything was going on. And I'm still not aware of any good data that shows that this is problematic, um, you know, in the future. In, in a nutshell, it's biology, right? It's just that we've 100% suppressed viral replication. It's just that there's enough residual reservoir cells that are infected that spit out virus periodically. Yeah. So let me create another scenario and uh, I'll pitch this to anyone who wants to jump in. But let's say he had been suppressed um, and then suddenly his viral load starts going up. It goes to 50, it goes to 120, it goes to 220. And you're, you know, he's nervous about it, you're nervous. What are the kind of questions you might ask that he complains, he, he, he swears 100% adherence to the regimen, 100%. Uh, what might be going on? Jill, I'll throw it back to you. You had your hand. I'm up. just going to do it quickly because I know I sort of know the answer to this. And you're going to oh. ask, have you, well, have you started any other medications? Ah. Would be one of the first questions I would ask. Yeah. So and Melody, I'll... what do you think you might have started that could be causing the problem here? Well, with your, your other hypothetical, um, I was going to say that we always want to check for interfering substances like calcium and magnesium and things like that, because, you know, we've been able to cure a lot of low level viremia by getting people to not take their uh, other medications at the same time. Um, uh, well, they're, they're supplements, really, uh, because it interferes with the binding of the integrase. Um, and so that can be a cause for low-level viremia. Um, I, I don't generally see that as a cause for virologic failure. And yeah, now we're getting a, into the virologic failure category. So um, uh, the, the case that's in the pretest uh, is actually a case I took care of. And the guy was remarkably adherent. I mean, he he would he was very adherent. And I just asked, what have, have you done anything? He said, Yeah, I started this multivitamin. Um, a few, about uh, four months ago. Uh-huh. And what's in it? And he read the label. Aha, uh -huh. it had divalent cations. So for those of you who are listening carefully, um, you might, if you missed that question on the pretest, I think you'll get it right now. This is a Roger Bedimo question. Um, woman who started on BICTAF uh, FTC um, had nice suppression, but is now back in your office complaining that her weight has gone from 145 to 171. And so now you talk nicely, you, you went over well about the associations and this metabolic syndrome situation. What are you gonna recommend? Let's let the audience vote and then I'm gonna turn it right to you, Roger. Let's vote and hear this next genre of music. Ah. So we're in the court with, um, We're in the English court with Henry VIII. We're doing the little you know, dance, whatever that is. I don't know. Actually, no, this is Appalachian Spring. Done in an English court style. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely Appalachian Spring. Okay. Roger, you're on. Respond to what the audience is doing and tell them yeah. what you. So. <clears throat> Yeah, so this is somebody who gained weight on a regimen that contains two drugs that we now know have been associated and um, uh, in in a number of studies to to with weight gain, uh, TAF and an integrase. Now the question that is dogging us now is that you know this is a woman and probably it's more likely to happen if that woman was non-white. And, um, and and the while most people don't gain weight, she did. And if she does, we think that most weight gain is just like uh, occurred with her front loaded, i.e. in the first uh, uh, year, sometimes even the first six months. And, and that's why I think that switching after that time is a little bit tricky because we don't know if the slope would have reversed if uh, uh, if we changed, if we had switched earlier, 
Um, so we don't have a great answer, except that we're beginning to because uh, presented in Glasgow as well. Um, um, and I think that some of the data uh, uh, is uh, gonna come out later, the advanced uh, advanced people, um, um, Francois Venter, because they keep they kept following people like that woman because it was 100% uh, African descent uh, and, and half women who, who switched after gaining weight. And according to the preliminary studies, this is behaving as, like you said, as one would expect in some declines in, in weight gain in those who were switched off of uh, uh, TAF and ST, but back to uh, NNRTIs. Now, what I don't know because the data is not out yet is do we have the same slope of decline that is mirroring the slope of race or the people who gain are the ones who lost. I don't know. So right. I, I, I must admit to the patient that a lot of people are now choosing option D and it's quite reasonable because it doesn't have instincts and it doesn't have TAF. Um, uh, solid evidence will, will come hopefully from the ACTG study that is ongoing. And, and that's, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Right. And so, um, well stated, I don't think we've seen anything yet that works. And we haven't talked much about Duravarine, uh, but it, it probably is worth a comment here that it doesn't seem to have the weight law, weight gain associated with it, especially if you have a TDF, which you've talked about already. Um, one of our audience members wanted us wanted to see the case again, so I put that back up. But let me move forward here. You've talked about this. And the NNRTIs don't tend to be as associated uh, with as much weight gain overall. So Duravarine might be, with someone you're worried about, uh, a good choice to uh, choose if you're worried about that up front, because it's not great evidence you write. There's a study going on. Uh, but this bit, this concept of going from, um, from TDF on the left-hand side to TAF, um, it, it, it could be a lot of people have proposed that it's actually TDF <clears throat> suppressing appetite, uh, and then you release that and they eat more, uh, et cetera. I don't know. Uh, we're going to find out, and Roger, we're going to look for you to lead the way with your colleagues um, to make that happen. Um, let's talk about pregnancy. Um, Susan's already alluded to this quite a bit, but let's move forward. And um, there was one question that I wanted to we go back to, um, oh, the, the the blips that might happen after uh, vaccination. Sure, that's biology, right? So you have cells that are just kind of hanging out. You stimulate them with a vaccine or some other antigen or an illness, and more virus gets spit into the circulation from the lymphoid tissue where those cells live. And that's, that's just the biologic kind of phenomena. So thanks for bringing that point up. Um, let's move on to the um, the case, this is more or less the same 30-year-old uh, woman who we saw a couple cases ago. It's a, the whole story is the same, except now uh, she she's six weeks pregnant when she gets diagnosed on routine uh, OB assessment. Um, so um, I think we can jump into this quickly. Let's go ahead and vote. And Susan, I'll turn right to you when the voting is over. Let's hear what our next musical selection is. Like I'm on an FM radio station in 1975. Hmm. Kind of a electric funk. Oh, it's uh, Bossa Nova. Yeah, you think? Blame it on the Bossa That's Nova. Blame it on the Cabanova. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> All right, so Cabanuba is not a choice. Let's go ahead and see what we got. Susan, you're on. Uh, so the guidelines, we would recommend uh, the integrase inhibitors, particularly the lotegravir, because uh, we now know that it is safe. And we have elevated TAF to recommend it. It used to be TDF only, but we have had enough experience with TAF uh, to recommend it the same level as TDF. So you could use a dolotegravir, TDF, or TAF combination. Um, and then 
uh, a back of ear if if you have the the issue with the back of ear it takes two weeks for it to come back and uh, we want to start therapy as soon as possible particularly in pregnancy because you have a limited timeline and we know that there's in utero transmission so the sooner we can decrease the viral load of the mother the sooner that we would like to start antiretroviral therapy and you know, with a back of ear, you have to wait for HLA B5701. So it's seldom used in practical uh, terms, but we have TAF, FTC, TAF, 3TC, TAF, uh, like I said, tenofovir. Um, and then we have dolotegravir would be the primary. We have, uh, I think we're coming up with the new guidelines, uh, downgrading rotegravir. A uh, little bit, um, and then the runavir will be the only one of the protease inhibitor that will be recommended, and we have downgraded at the so, Yeah, uh, thank you. And what about a couple people chose bictegravir? Um, is it are there data and sufficient? I mean, insufficient we, data. Insufficient, so not yes. quite yet. These not are this yet. is kind of a compilation of what's out there now with the updated ISUSA guidelines and the and the HHS, there's congruence. And I think, as you mentioned, most people, it's interesting, isn't it? it Dalutegravir two and a half years ago was like- <laughs> was the pariah. Yeah, and all of a sudden, oh, hey, it's, it's preferred. Well, wow, uh, that's about as good an example of answers changing. Uh, and the same thing happened with the Favarins for those of us who were around long. And it was the same exact problem, right? With the neural hey. tube. It's six weeks and folate interactions and all that stuff. Um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, let me check the QA here real quick. Um, why downgrade raltegravir with it? Is it the BID dosing? Is that your the thing? BID dosing. And also, you know, if you have, for not for this particular, but if you have a very high viral load, it's, uh, we, we, the, the place for raltegravir right now is when we have a late diagnosis of pregnancy and very high viral loads, we might use raltegravir to boost the decrease right. uh, in, in the viral load in a very short period of time. So uh, yeah, at the sound of beer, because, you know, it has hyperbilirubinemia, it, it's, uh, the runavir is, is really more forgiving in many yeah. ways than at the sun of beer. So I and think- especially if you're taking H2 blockers and- Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and a lot of women it, have have uh, reflux during pregnancy. Yeah, we're hoping that the, by January, the new guidelines will be coming out for the parenting. Well, we look forward to that. A couple of really quick questions to answer. Uh, are, do you prefer maybe TDF here over TAF because of the worry about weight gain? You know, when we look about gestational weight gain, um, there's really no uh, consensus about gestational weight gain uh, and uh, instees uh, with either TAF or TDF, uh, especially on different populations. A lot of the studies have been done in African populations and right. uh, you know, it depends on your initial weight to start right. with. And so there are many other variables. So, you know, I me, have to, I have to. The next like, question, I'm sorry. I, do, I just want to make sure we have time. Um, if, if somebody's already on BIC and they come to you, do you change it or stay? Keep no, it? if they're already below detectable, fully suppressing BIC, we will continue the BIC. Dick it out. Okay. Uh, yeah, Dr. Thompson, you, know. <laughs> you, had a, you had a question or? Well, no, I just wanted to point out that, you know, the, the reason um, to favor TAF um, in pregnancy also is from the clinical trial data of the IMPACT 2010 study showing TAF uh, superior to TDF. Yeah. Um, so I think that's an, another point for using TAF in pregnancy. Great. And thanks. And, and Norma Rolfson, thank you for your comment about uh, the, the choices for pregnant women are a whole lot better than the 90s radio station I referred to where all we use is I don't you do. no, and, and delete our, you know, my goodness, if we hated people, they, that's a regimen you give them. Um, okay, because you throw up every day. 
Um, how do we manage uh, who has freak, a person who has frequent STIs? Anybody see that? 35-year-old um, guy uh, diagnosed 10 years ago, doing well on his regimen, but he keeps coming back to clinic into what we call sick call with a new uh, STI, and it, it varies. It, it, sometimes it's a double header. Rarely it's a triple header with all three, you know, the, the, the full Monty there, um, but we're treating them a lot. And the question then comes up, uh, what do you do in this setting when they're coming in frequently? Do you just counsel each time? Do you offer sort of a chronic, uh, give them some amoxicillin and say, take this uh, after each encounter, offer doxy, offer suffixing, uh, or would you just, uh, well, it states for itself. Let's see the music and answer the question. like Bollywood, maybe some Cleopatra dance. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Doxy has jumped to the top. <laughs> yeah. All right, Roger, you got the two thumbs up. Why don't you make a comment here? <laughs> it's it's the new morning after pill. <laughs> so, now, well, I think uh, you know I would like to see uh, more more data on this, and I, I think that is a critical need. The patient you presented is about a quarter of people on prep, and and because the studies have shown that a quarter of them would 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 be presenting with STI that we need to address, and if indeed we could reduce that that incidence by sixty plus percent. Um, I think it behooves us to try. We don't have longer data on risk, including emergence of resistance and uh, toxicity, but I, I think uh, I'm very encouraged by what I've seen so far. Yeah. I, exactly. I mean, I, I agree. I'm, I have, uh, we had a big discussion in our clinic if we were going to start to do this sort of as a group and not have individual providers making different recommendations. And we seem to come to a consensus that we want to discuss this with patients. Um, you know, obviously make the point that this is preliminary data. Um, I, I still don't think the manuscript is out, so it hasn't been peer reviewed and, and we need to see longer term data. But for, for a lot of the patients and, and you know, Doxy Pep looked at people living with HIV and people taking PrEP, you know, it had really great benefits. And, you know, what does this look like for, uh, you know, ultimately for a clinic, for a patient who doesn't have to come back so much. The thing that I've um, run into is the way that you write the prescription um, and pharmacies uh, being somewhat confused about that. So uh, sort of, you know, do you write it as if you're treating someone for chlamydia and say 100 milligrams twice a day, but actually tell them you'd take it 200 milligrams post you know, sexual encounter, or can you do it 200 milligrams post-sexual encounter um, without the, the the pharmacy saying, what is this for? Yeah. So Joel A. just commented uh, that he, you know, appropriate, we're all concerned about resistance, but he's commenting that he's seen it frequently in his clinical practice. Uh, I'm not sure if that's, uh, uh, I guess to the GC, that might be the one. I'm not sure. I've not seen that in chlamydia. Frequently in terms of just the, these, it's, it's not more specific, but the I think everyone's concerned. I think, um, especially I think about the GC. Has anyone seen chlamydia resistance to <clears throat> doxy? I, yeah. I mean, it, we could, uh, but it is a concern. Um, we are yeah. getting a little short on time. I want to get to a couple more things. So one of which I promised was about a Bacavir. So this is a real life kind of thing that we're dealing. Sixty two year old guy. Um, he he been. Uh, he's been long-standing HIV patient, long-standing, uh, but he's been on this abacavir, uh 3TC dolutegravir regimen for uh, for many years. Um, he's a smoker, 62. He's on a torvastatin and low-dose aspirin. Uh, his doc thought enough about that, and he's coming back to you and on this <coughs> regimen. So the question is, would you just continue or would you switch him off of... Uh, a Bacavir to something else. Um, go ahead and vote.
Hmm. This sounds like it came from the play once. If you saw that, it's a good play. It's a little obscure, but um, guitarist, you know, whose uh, love story that kind of dissolves into a, an oblivion, actually. Um, let's see what we got here. Okay, so only about 16% would stay the course here. And I'm not sure it matters greatly. We want them to quit smoking. Uh, that's probably the best thing you could do. And we should say that 18 times because that relative risk of abacavir is heavily dwarfed by the risk of smoking. You can do a lot to go from a current smoker to a past smoker. Um, anybody want to take this? Um, Roger, I've been picking on you a lot. That's why. Yeah, go ahead. I, I I totally agree that uh, you know, this, the audience doesn't need us to tell them that smoking is bad for you, but smoking while living with HIV is downright terrible, uh, downright terrible for you. It, uh, the consequences dwarf those of any other risk factors that we have here in front of us, including antiretrovirals. Now, like we, uh, Connie and I were having this discussion earlier, uh, the, 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 the book on the back of you is not closed yet. I, I don't think that we have. Um, uh, and while the risk that we're seeing uh, 14 or so years ago, almost identified uh, uh, early on, uh, it's not clear that this person who's suppressed on this after uh, months or years um, would incur additional risk, though where it is possible. So one option is uh, to simply remove a back of you um, and uh, dolitegravir and 3TC would be uh, probably okay with uh, with this person and uh, as well uh, as well as option three. And, yeah, and so, what, in this is a situation you could even just go to dolitegravir 3TC, just drop the abacavir and go right. with that. He's fully suppressed and yeah. probably would, would work okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the questions that, that I heard from the audience just now. Um, We've already talked about this. Uh, I didn't. I forgot that I had this in here. But the point I was going to make, uh, and uh, and Stephanie, if we can just skip the QRS. Option on option six is the correct answer. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, but smoking is what I was trying to get across here, and we we've kind of already talked about that. I will mention a few things. You know, there are heart attacks that happen in patients. Um, the Scenix did a study where they literally adjudicated every quote unquote heart attack in a medical record. Uh, first observation was that uh, up to about half of the diagnoses in an EMR of a heart attack found were found to not be a myocardial infarction of any sort. So it shows how, how we all ought to read the literature carefully uh, when people are pre presenting data from cohorts where the outcome is not fully adjudicated, like an MI, and you say, well, how does it get in the chart? And the answer is because it might have been in the hospital, you can't put rule out as a diagnosis. So you put myocardial infarction, but people, as they get discharged and were ruled out, don't take the diagnosis off the chart. So it remains there. And those type of medical errors and EMRs are prevalent. But what was fascinating is that it was, uh, uh, there was a distribution of primary, which would you think of as uh, when we think of heart attacks, but it was about equal between type one and type two MIs. And the type two occurred, type one, you know, type two occurred in the 39 year old population, which makes sense. It's supply demand mismatch. And I'll skip that. But the take home point is a lot of us, I'll speak first person. I resisted accepting the original cohort data for that reason I just said, but also because the clinical trials where there was randomization did not show ever show a difference when you had randomization between abacavir and no abacavir. On the other hand, those were very young people as a rule who had no significant comorbidities. And I think we now are seeing that this is being repeated time and time and time again. And so I think it, with other choices and a guy who's at high risk of uh, switching makes sense. All right, let's, let's, um, finish up here with some new things. Um, this is a person who comes in uh, with new skin lesions and uh, a 30 year old uh, buttocks growing back, face, febrile, uh, uh, several different sexual partners uh, recently. Um, his HIV RNA is a little bit up because he's been off and he's using um, methamphetamine. 
So uh, after the screening for other STIs and encouraging him to start back on his ARVs, what do you do here? What's the diagnosis or would you just phone a friend? Or is this just bad luck, Roger? Um, maybe it's that too. Okay, let's vote and hear some music. Kind of a sad country music. So, well, let's see what we got here. Okay, so most people would start uh, ticaveramat, uh, which is tpox, at the visit. Um, it, it, sadly, that well, this is mpox. I think everybody recognized that. Um, I, I think, in the interest of time, I'm just going to run through this so we get to the last case real quick. But um, yes, we would treat this person. He's viewed at higher risk. Early on, we weren't um, because of short supply. I will say because of the uh, early use authorization, the paperwork associated with this is a deterrent, <laughs> right? It's it, uh, I've done this personally, and it's 45 minutes of paperwork, and it, it's a mess. So there's a clinical trial in the ACTG that would randomize, but I have to say, honestly, every time I've presented the uh, informed consent options and say, well, we could treat you or put you on the trial where you might not get treated, that latter option doesn't resonate very well to somebody who's got a lot of skin lesions and febrile. Um, but well, we would not necessarily vaccinate them now, but if they were exposed to someone who was known to be positive, we would do some vaccination up front. And let's move, any other comments? Um, I, I was just going to quickly make the comment about the trial you brought up, Stomp. Um, you know, actually, if you go to the CDC website, it says that's the first thing you should do is inform the people yeah. of the study. Um, but it's it sounds like that's been well, a deterrent. Unfortunately, some other breaking news, in case you missed it, is that uh, last day or so, they announced that uh, this January 31st, the emergency declaration about MPOX will disappear. And that's great news in a backhanded way because it means we've got it under control. And then just finally, um, treating COVID in the setting. This is uh, the same guy we had before, but he comes back, he tests positive, he has sore throat. He tests positive at home for COVID. And importantly, he's on dalutegravir, lamivudine, and he's on rosuvastatin, carbamazepine, rivaroxaban, and, uh, and uh, uh, sildenafil. So um, what are you going to do here in the current era? Are you going to treat with uh, Paxlovid? Are you going to treat with an infusion of monoclonal antibody? Let's go ahead and vote Molnupiravir. Would you start prednisone? Let's vote. Mm. Going south of the border. Now that's near you guys in San Diego. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, most people would use that. Any what's fascinating, what a what an interesting, well-informed audience, right? Nobody bit on the monoclonal antibody. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. Um, because that would have been a great choice a year ago, right? One of those. But now we know that they don't work. The remdesivir outpatient is a great option if you can strategically make it work. You got to do it early in the first couple of days, as you do with Paxlovid. The, there's a lot of drug interactions here with the Paxlovid and the current regimen. You're going to have to, the carbamazepam is going to be a real bear to get around. Um, and uh, so I deliberately, the statin you could just hold, but um, I think the remdesivir in this guy might be the best. And I'm sorry for uh, barring the panel out of this discussion, but it, we're a minute 48 over. So I thought I'd just kind of comment and wrap up. Any quick comments from anybody? Uh, Want to highlight some anything? anything? Okay. Um, this is our current variants, uh, especially the, it's actually uh, the BQ1 and BQ1.1 and BF7, now well 70%. And unfortunately, what we're seeing now, and this is what we didn't want to see, um, is that there's illness that's coming up in a big way. Uh, Utah, I know, is being swamped 
California is showing an increase. Um, the last week, overall U.S. cases are up about 35 to 40 percent of COVID, and we have influenza and RSV. So we're in, we're in a bad way. But the take-home point is that those three variants I just mentioned do not respond to any of the monoclonals to speak of. And so we've lost that option. Um, so to conclude, ARV therapy should be initiated with generally an, an INSTE-based regimen unless uh, otherwise indicated the weight gain we talked about, um, especially with INSTE and TAF, but you know, it's a trade-off. Uh, Dalutegravir has become the drug of choice in women. And once you find out that somebody's pregnant, give folate, but it's usually the pregnancy test is often done after six weeks, so it's a little late for the neural tube. Um, simplification of regimens is doable. We talked about that, drug-drug interactions when choosing therapy for COVID, we went over quickly. And then this notion of emerging uh, trends in doxycycline. Uh, I will try to answer the questions that we have um, just with typing it in, but I think we need to close here. Um, Dr. Benson, I'll kick it back to you. Panelists, you were great. Thank you very much. And it was a very lively discussion and uh, hopefully informative. So Dr. Benson. So thank you to all of the panelists and especially to Dr. Sag for the uh, really carefully presented and thought about cases. And I think it led to some lively discussion. So we really appreciate that, including the, the comments from the audience, which we also really appreciate. Um, we're gonna break now until 11.15 uh, Pacific time, convert that to whatever time zone you all are in. But that's about a uh, 18 minute break at this point. So see you back here at 11.15 Pacific time. <laughs>